It is finally here, the brand new Garmin Edge 840. Nearly four years after the previous generation was released, we finally got a brand new Edge 540 as well as an 840. Now I've been riding these things all over the place, putting tons and tons of mileage in to test out all the new features, both the hardware as well as the software. Well, this review is focused on the Edge 840. There's also the Edge 540 review up in the corner as well. Now, the first thing you need to know is the price. The Edge 840 starts at $449 for the base edition and $549 for the solar edition. Now, there is a ton of new things to talk about. And the very first difference that you'll notice is the new solar panel along the outside edge. Now, as I mentioned, there are two different versions of this computer. There's a base version and the version with solar, just like there was two different versions of the Edge 1040 last summer. Now, if you look on the outside edge here, you'll see the solar panel. In fact, if we do this, you can see it on the It's that red section around the outer edge there, that is a solar panel with essentially 100% photovoltaic level. There's some like technical nuances here, but for simplicity's sake, 100% on the outside edge there versus the 15% photovoltaic level over the entire display. The whole thing has solar over it. In fact, you'll actually see side by side, if you have a non-solar and a solar edition, the solar one is a little bit dimmer, a little bit darker. It's not like massively darker, but it is certainly noticeable. This is the same basic technology that Garmin has rolled out on their Phoenix and Instinct and a Forerunner and a bunch of other uh, watches over the last couple of years. So there's two different ways you can charge via solar. And of course you can always charge via the USB port on the bottom, but we'll talk about more of that in a second. Uh, via solar though, as you're just during your ride riding along, it'll be constantly charging. Now it won't charge as fast as you're burning, but there's actually a dedicated display page that you can see how much solar time you've gained and the solar intensity level while you're riding. And as you can see at the end of some of these stats, so these are some pretty long rides in really sunny conditions in Majorca, so in the Mediterranean, in spring, so it's not summer, but uh, really sunny conditions. But of course, in those cloudy and rainy days, you're not gonna gain much of anything, if anything at all. And the second way is if you go into sleep mode, you can also gain battery there. It'll show you the solar intensity level as it turns off. And I put it out on the kind of like candle railing of my deck for a while on a really sunny day. Uh, and for about two hours of full sun and another about two hours of like half sun, as you can see, it didn't gain much percentage at all, like barely one to 2% on these different units. But unless you live in a place that's sunny all the time and you're riding a lot, it probably not gonna notice it. Now, the thing that you will notice though is the size difference. Uh, it's a little bit chunkier, a little bit wider. You can see side by side right here. This is the 840 and this is the 830. Uh, and I think the reason that is of course to accommodate that solar panel. In fact, all of the 540, 540 solar, 840, 840 solar, they're all the exact same dimensions, exact same case sizes across the board. Next up, we've got the marquee new software feature on the Edge 840 and 540 and coming as of today also to the 1040 and beta, uh, which is freestyle or free ride climb pro basically like Climb Pro Uncensored. So if you use Climb Pro in the past on a Garmin device, you know that essentially what it allows you to do is if you had a course or a route loaded up, it'll show you the climbs that are upcoming for that particular course or route. And while you're riding, you'll see the amount of elevation to the top, the average gradient remaining, the actual gradient itself. Uh, again, super, super cool. The problem was that up until now, you actually had to have a course loaded. So if you were just riding along on just a normal ride where you knew where you were going, you wouldn't actually see any of the climbs at all. But then a year ago on the Hammerhead Crew, one of their competitors, they announced basically like a free ride version of that where you could just be riding along and boom, it would show you the climbs that are upcoming. Well, now Garmin has joined the fray with the exact same thing here. The way it works is that as you're riding along, you'll go ahead and get a notification about 150 meters out, give or take, that there's a climb upcoming. And then once you cross that magical threshold of the climb, it'll go ahead and start showing you the exact same climb pro screens as before. In fact, all the technical specifications for the climb are identical. Uh, so it's generally 500 meters in length and 3% gradient as a starting point. Now in terms of how well this works in real life, I've been putting that to the test. Essentially there's like two categories of how well it works. The first is the really clear cut climbs. The climbs where you go up a mountain pass or whatever it may be in the top, the only choice for the road is to go back down again. And in those cases, like the soccer Lobra climb I did last week in Majorca, very clear cut. Like the spot at the top where that little peak is, is like the size of a bus, right? Like there's no other way to go. It's just back down again. Beautifully nailed that. Zero problems. The climb ended exactly at the top there. Uh, that was all great. Where it gets messier though, is if you've got a road that splits somewhere as a junction. In that case, it tries to take all of the heat map popularity routing to figure out where you're going and where that climb should end. It says, hey, you know what? The vast majority of people keep on going up this road. Therefore, we think the climb is up here. And that works like 80, 90% of the time, but sometimes it just gets it wrong. And mind you, this unit can't read your mind. When there is multiple routes, it's gonna take a guess and hope that you go on that particular route. Garmin acknowledges that there's probably gonna be some iterations on this over the coming months and software versions to kind of like fine tune that a little bit. 
which is essentially the exact same thing that Hammerhead said when they announced it a year ago, and they found that kind of middle ground as well. Now, I have had a couple of quirks that are worthwhile noting. Uh, number one is that I had a road where the road physically ended asphalt-wise, but then went like off-road dirting, and it told me to keep on going up that despite being in the road profile. Uh, Garmin says they figured out that particular issue and have solved it in a firmware update that should already be here. Overall, it's super cool. Again, I used it a ton last week in Mallorca. There's constant climbs, and it was cool. It just turned on. Like, I didn't, didn't do anything. I, I'm liking it overall. Now with that is the new Climb Pro Explorer. So if you simply swipe down from the top there and then go all the way across, you'll see Climb Explorer. Uh, and this shows you all the climbs in your nearby area. In my case, because I live in a flat place, I had to go ahead and expand out the search radius to 100 kilometers, uh, but you can also change the difficulty level and the uh, terrain type, etc. Here's a screenshot of what it looks in a place that has a lot more climbs. Uh, and then from there, you can tap on one of these climbs, you can see the profile for it, and then you can just route to that point. So you can be like, you know what, I'm gonna go and check out this climb over here, and off you go. And by the way, one fun tidbit about this is that they preload all this climb data in the map itself. Uh, so what you'll notice now, if you're downloading the maps from Garmin onto any of the edge devices, is the maps have exploded in size because they're pre-caching all of that data. They've also got a slightly higher threshold for what things show up in Climb Explorer because of that data, because they have to include more things in there. You just imagine like how many climbs are out there in the world, like every little road that qualifies on one of those two things, a 500 meters and 3% grade, shows up here. It's kind of mind-boggling. Also kind of mind-boggling is if you hit that little like and subscribe button right now on the bottom there, it really does help out this channel quite a bit. Just the way YouTube works. I don't I don't actually control it, but it really does help. The next new thing is the new multi-band GPS. So if I just go over here, you'll see GPS right there. Tap on that, and you've got multi-band GNSS. Essentially, it means hyper-accurate GPS. It's very, very accurate in this mode. It does, of course, burn mode battery in that mode. Uh, and I'll talk about the GPS accuracy later on in the review, but I mean, the, the short version is it's, it's spot on, like deadly accurate. And in fact, while we're talking about being deadly accurate, one of the things that can be challenging with the touchscreen display like the Edge 830 previously, was that you didn't have all the buttons on the side. The Edge 830 actually had less buttons than the 530 because it was designed to be a touchscreen display. But with the Edge 840, it mirrors the same external case design, including all the same buttons of the Edge 540, which lacks a touchscreen display. Long story short here, you see there's now more buttons, right? You got all these buttons on the side here, you got all these extra buttons, over here, plus the start and stop buttons in the bottom. It's got all the buttons. It's as, it's as simple as that. You can do every operation you want to via touch or buttons. Uh, the only one that you cannot do via touch is starting and stopping the timer. That is always the bottom two buttons right there, as well as the lap button. Next, a quickie. Uh, it's got USB-C on the bottom. There we go. Like, we should just sing hallelujah. But it's there. It's awesome. Finally, good to see. The other thing you're probably seeing right now is a very different user interface. This is the new revamp user interface. Uh, this is the same user interface as found on the Edge 1040. Uh, and these are essentially like these widget glance menu right there. You can customize these. Uh, you can see the glances. I can add more glances. Uh, I can add third party ones from Connect IQ. Uh, all of this is within this new revamp user interface. And I'd say this revamp user interface works great on the Edge 840. And then not to spoil some of my review, but on the Edge 540, it's, it's a little more cumbersome. But check out that review up there and I'll kind of talk through that a little bit more. Now one of the widgets that you'll see in here uh, is the new training status. Now you've had training status on the 830 in the past, but this is training status 2.0, which is basically a revamped version of it that tries to not get you into the unproductive messaging quite as much. Uh, now training status has a couple components. It's got your VO2 max, it's got your acute load. Those are the two main things. So if I go ahead and press down here, so you can see press down or I can swipe if I want to, either way. You see my VO2 max? Now, now, as I said in one of my recent reviews, though, this value has not changed for me in the last six months, since November-ish. Uh, and I have massively increased my training load uh, since January, so four months ago. Uh, and I've also increased my FTP now by almost 30 over that time period. Like, huge, huge fitness gains. And this has just been, like, across the board stuck. So it kind of a bit of a bummer. Uh, on the bright side, I just use the acute load instead. Acute load's looking at your training load from the last seven days, and that's combined with some of those other components to form your training status. Additionally, in here, you'll find your exercise load uh, as well as your load focus. Those are kind of two views of roughly the same thing, showing categorization of uh, your particular training load. You'll also see the new cycling ability feature. Uh, so this is something that shows you what you're strong at or not strong at, and gives you an analysis of those things. And then from there, you can look at a given course. Uh, so I can choose, for example, uh, this course I did in Belgium a couple days ago here. 
And if I scroll on down, you'll see course demands, and it'll show you how well you do in that particular course. Now with that is another new feature from the 1040, which is Power Guide. So if I go back here, actually it's right there. There we go, perfect. Uh, so you can see Power Guide. So you take a course, a known course with a known elevation profile, and then you can do Power Guide on either the unit itself or on Garmin Connect. You can see right here, uh, me configuring it for Garmin Connect for this cobblestone route that I did in uh, Belgium. And if I go ahead and choose that, on the device, I can also see what my particular goal is. So I say goal effort towards the harder side, and it'll say it'll take 1.75 to 2.75 hours, it's 77% of my FTP. And you can see the average power there and the max power there and some of the climbs as well. And if I go on down further, you can see it has the FTP, my rotting position, my gear weight, my road train, and then the splits. So going down here, you can see this particular uh, incline or hill right there. That's 664 meters long, 7.1% grade, and wants me to ride that at 382 watts. Uh, and if I were to change up here, this particular goal effort, I'll just go halfway. We'll go down and look at that again. It's going to recalculate real quickly here. That same hill now, if I go down to that, is 311 watts. And you can basically choose based on what's going to happen. And then while you're out riding, you'll see each one of these core sections divided up. This is roughly like Best Bike Split in kind of a very generic sense. Uh, Best Bike Split being a third party app that does the same sort of thing, except that has way more variables in it to get more accurate split times. Still, this gives you a goal that you should theoretically be able to ride based on your cycling profile. Speaking of which, there's the new ability to train for races. Uh, this is something that started rolling out kind of in a soft launch at last fall. So if I go all the way back here to the screen, uh, you can create an event on your calendar. Uh, so I created an event 10 weeks out called Primary Event. So if I tap on that right there, uh, and you can see the particulars of this event, 180K, there's the course profile. You create all this on Garmin Connect, you load that course into there, including even like the race name, the race icon if you want to, the time of day it starts, like. And then as you get closer and closer to the race, they'll tell you race conditions. You can see right here, here is the average weather uh, in that location for that particular day, which is kind of handy. Uh, but more importantly though, it's gonna build out your entire training calendar. So if I go to our training right there, I look at workouts and look at daily suggested workouts. And you can see these are the workouts every single day going up into that. So I look at the threshold one. Uh, here's the threshold ride for Thursday, so we're on 15 minutes, and then bike 15 minutes, 269 to 314, and so on. And it creates these workouts every single day. And if I go back here, I can tap in the upper little bubbles, click plan overview, and you can see here is how it's gonna build out this plan. The base phase between now and then, the peak phase, the taper phase, the actual event itself, and then the recovery phase. Uh, and if you have a Garmin wearable and you have sleep data feeding into this and other metrics, it'll all combine that together. So if you go out for a hard run, it'll start to reorganize this a little bit to account for a hard run impacting your training schedule. Now changing directions a little bit, there's a bunch of new navigational features here, or at least navigational concepts. So if I tap on navigation, Navigation there, that's pretty straightforward, a list of all the ways you can navigate, so you can browse a map, courses, mountain bike trail navigation, uh, search, save locations, fine. But what's cool, if I go to search here, you'll see these are new bike forward categories. So bike repair, convenience, restrooms, water stops, coffee stops, uh, and so on. You can still go down and find things like, you know, shopping and community and stuff. But in the past, these were all like car focused things because they came from Garmin's car maps, but now they're cycle focused. It's cool. I can look at this and say, hey, where's the nearest bike shop? I tap that, all bike shops. And you can see this is super fast, by the way. This is like virtually instant. Uh, I can also tap this and search and I can type things in there. Now, if we go back though into courses here, I can tap on a course. Uh, this is how you probably can navigate most of the time. Like I rarely use the other ways to navigate. I'm mostly gonna load courses from Strava and Kamut or ones I've created on Garmin Connect. Uh, so if I go down here, I'm just gonna find one of the courses from the other day. There we go. I tap the course. I think for a second, uh, and you go down, you can see the summary and stuff like that, like in the past. You can also see the climbs ahead of time. So these are the Climb Pro climbs on that particular course. Uh, so this is the one in Belgium there. Uh, and if I go on back, I can choose to ride the course. And then at this point, it'll say, do you want to navigate to the beginning of the course? Now, given this course is like 250 kilometers away, I'm not going to choose to navigate to it from here. But the point is you can do that and it'll just give you instant instructions. And I say instant because it really is basically instant now for both calculating routes as well as route recalculation. Some of that's like smoke and mirrors where in the past they would calculate the entire route ahead of time. And there was no reason to calculate something you're not going to get to another five hours from now. Versus now they only show that calculation for like that much just because they just calculate the first like couple hundred meters and then hide it all behind the scenes. And that's fine. That's what everyone else does anyways. In terms of recalculating, that's where some of the big changes are. In the past with an Edge 830, 530, etc., it would immediately start recalculating when off course, even if it would just briefly, and sometimes that would take forever. Now though, like with a 1040, it shows us a new little screen that basically says, hey, do you want to pause navigation? Do you want to automatically recalculate? And then if we start recalculating, here's different ways you could recalculate, including like rejoining the course and skipping and so on. 
this is great if you want to like just go take a picture a couple hundred meters away at the beach or something and don't want it to recalculate everything and redo your whole route. You just want to like pause for a second and then go do your thing. Now another feature that works pretty well is that you can use your phone to configure all the data fields on this. That's something that people have long said about you know Wahoo devices is that you can use your phone to configure everything uh, versus inversely with Garmin devices which is always on the device itself. Now you can do both like you choose your phone if you want to configure all the data fields like you see right here or you can just do it on the device. Like you pick sort of thing and it, it works just fine. Now let's talk about three types of accuracy. The first one is gradient responsiveness, the next is GPS, and then elevation. Uh, so first on gradient responsiveness, a common complaint people have had is that Garmin's gradient responsiveness is too slow. And in particular I'm talking about if you're going up a hill, how long it says until it says you're going up a steep section right there. So I went out and I did a lot of tests on this. Uh, I did a lot of tests in the past too at the 1040, but even more tests this time with the 540, 840, and the 1040 from Garmin, the Hammerhead Crew 2, and the Wahoo Roam 2. And I've picked long, slow hills, and I've picked really steep, fugly hills that were 20% plus gradient. I picked hills with cobblestones, without cobblestones, like I tested all the things. And I've got a whole separate video on that. But the long and the short of it though is that for really steep hills, the hills that go like this, the FU hills, uh, those ones, the Garmin units will lag behind about 10 seconds, give or take, compared to the Hammerhead Crew 2. The Crew 2 is by far the fastest responder for gradient, and the Garmin tends to be the slowest. The Wahoo Roam 2 is a little bit faster than the Garmin's, but not noticeably so. For more gradual hills that just kind of like slowly ramp up, you'll never notice a difference. It's virtually a wash on all of them. However, and this is the really important piece, if you look at Climb Pro, so you're looking ahead on a big climb, you know, a climb that's lasting 15, 20, 45 an hour uh, long, in that case, the Garmin data is far better than the Hammerhead data. Uh, so in that case, I'm not talking about the on-sensor data, but the data about what's upcoming in the climbs. And Hammerhead will frequently show that I'll have a 22% climb section coming up when it's nothing. It's literally nothing. It's just, you know, cruise along at 7% or something like that. Uh, and Garmin doesn't have that happen. And when I've asked Hammerhead about this in the past, they said it's unfortunately their underlying data and they're working to fix that, but they've been working to fix that now for two years and haven't quite nailed it. So essentially it's a trade-off. If you do a lot of rides that have a very like abrupt FU sort of change in gradient, uh, where it just is constantly going between like 0% and 20%, then the Hammerhead's going to do a better job of that. But if that doesn't really happen or only happens once in an entire climb, then you've still got the other hour of that climb where the data is more correct on the Garmin side than the Hammerhead side. It's, you kind of pick your poison. Anyways, the good news for things that you don't have to pick poison for is GPS accuracy. So let's jump over to the computer for that. If I look at a number of different GPS tracks in mountains and non-mountain city, all of it looks pretty good. Here's an example right now, just climbing up on these really tight switchbacks and it's spot on. In fact, all the units are basically spot on. And again, descending the switchback section right here of Sakalobra, just no problems at all. Everything's pretty much spot on. In fact, that's like the general theme here. Like there's really not much to complain about. Whether it be in the cities next to buildings right here or through tunnels right here or out in the open, right here it's it's been like perfect across the board which kind of makes sense given it's the same platform as the edge 1040 which has also been perfect for people for the last you know year basically in terms of elevation accuracy the same as well it's pretty much matching across the board with all the other units i have out there and except in this case when the crew two didn't match those units but otherwise again all the same okay so what's my final recommendation on this thing it's the, basically the bike computer to beat right now. Sure, you have the 1040 at the higher end if you want a bigger screen, but software-wise, it's the exact same features between the 840 and the 1040. It is purely a difference in battery and display size and overall size of the case. And in fact, the 840 has more buttons than the 1040 does in case you want those. Uh, as far as the 540, Right now, I feel like that user interface with the buttons only configuration of the 540, it just needs a bit more work. It's just kind of, I'm not loving the way that works, like getting in between certain parts of the menu is kind of cumbersome. So for the moment, I'd recommend the 840 overall. With that, if you found this video interesting and useful, whack that like button at the bottom there, or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. Have a good one.